Uh, so welcome everyone to this session of uh, Humanist Australia series on a number of issues to do with humanism. Um, my name is Les Allen and I will be the moderator tonight and assisting will with uh, me doing the uh, moderating is Vince and, um, and Akiva. So um, our special guest tonight is uh, Michael Dove and he's speaking on, believe it or not, religious and non-religious uh, in Australia. In tonight's presentation, Michael Dove will outline the trends of religious belief in Australia and provide an update on the contentious Australian Bureau statistics plans for the 2026 census. He will also shine a light on current and planned campaign priorities aimed at giving the non-religious a fair go and levelling the playing field to help Australia plot a path towards a pluralistic, secular democracy. Special note, the views expressed by the speakers in this series um, are their own and may not necessarily reflect the official position of Humanist Australia. Now, about our speaker tonight, Michael Dove. Uh, Michael has a background in teaching, academia, and applied democrat demographics. He is passionate about using reliable data evidence and quality rhetoric in guiding debate and policy to shape a better society. I think this bio is quite understated. I think Michael is one of the big drivers in advancing the secular cause in Australia today with all the work he's done, you'll see tonight in, um, in uh, trying to guide um, the ABS into improving the question on the census. But on top of that, Michael is seminal um, and uh, one of the key uh, organisers for last year's Secularism Australia conference. So thank you, uh, Michael. You're very welcome, Les. It's good to be here. Thanks for um, you know, a, good, a good number of people also um, giving up some time on Thursday evening. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, I just wonder if um, uh, if anybody has actually heard of Ripley's, um, which is a franchise uh, created in 1918 by Robert Ripley. Um, it's it's an American-based um, franchise. Um, I believe they do have one in uh, in the Gold Coast or in uh, certainly in Queensland somewhere. Um, but um, uh, when it started out, they created this feature called an auditorium and. And what Ripley's franchise called Believe It or Not is all about is basically uh, revealing the, the amazing facts um, about this world and, and uh, as, you know, astounding people, and usually in an entertaining way, um, about, uh, you know, the, uh, the facts about natural things um, in, in the world, um, celebrating the weird and wonderful things in the world in, in a... In an, in an entertaining and engaging way. Um, all of his exhibits, um, apart from a very small number that were debunked uh, in the past, but virtually all of them are based on verifiable information. Uh, and I think, uh, and his core proposition was basically strange, but true. Uh, and I think that if you're, a, if you're cynical about um, religion, which not everyone is, and I'm not sure that I am, 100% of the time either, but if you're cynical about religion, you might relate to uh, a couple of those um, those those uh, points. Um, I think belief in um, uh, in religion is something which is a little different to being amazed and impressed and astounded by the facts of uh, our weird and wonderful world. Um, religion, I think, is maybe more a matter of faith. Um, and, and I think that what it means, what faith means, um, as per the dictionary, is that we've got great trust or confidence in something or someone. And, uh, uh, but I think the, the reality with religion, um, arguably, is that the sources of evidence or verification, uh, unlike in the case of Ripley's, um, the source of evidence and verification are really ancient texts which have been much transcribed and retranscribed and translated and retranslated, such as the Bible, the Quran or the Torah or many similar things, or uh, alternatively claims of supernatural events, 
And here I'm thinking of uh, events such as uh, Lourdes and uh, and many other occasions uh, which have been um, described as you know divine intervention or miracles or in some form. Um, so the argument is: um, is this really belief or is it faith? Um, uh, and I think that religions, uh, I would suggest, probably have a bit of a vested interest in conflating the difference between belief and faith. So what I intend to do in this um, in this presentation really is to uh, to talk about uh, some research, um, and a lot of it is is about uh, research charts, um, uh, and I'll be drawing on some evidence. Uh, if you like, because um, we, we like to draw on all, all, all decisions these days should be based on good evidence. And um, the first of those uh, sources of evidence is going to be the 2021 census. Uh, and I apologise if one or two may have seen one or two of the earlier slides in this presentation. Most of the slides are prepared for this presentation and they are new. Um, but uh, and I also apologise um, if you're not comfortable looking at charts, um, which are, in my view, I think a more accessible way of presenting evidence. Um, and in particular with the census, you know, being, it, because it is almost a 100% survey uh, of Australians, it's a pretty good, uh, if you like, a demographic picture um, as, to, um, as to what uh, Australia's demographic uh, characteristics are like. And what I've done is to focus on the religious dimensions uh, of demographics. And that really is the first of the things that I will be going through. Um, I will draw attention to, uh, so the first of those will be uh, in relation to the census. Um, I'm going to make a little bit of a disclaimer to um, clarify, if you like, the frame in which I'm using the census. The way in which census data is reported um, is at different levels of detail. Um, there is the course group level um, level one, um, which is basically reduces religion down to uh, I think it's seven or eight groupings. Um, uh, and the one that we're focused on is the one called group seven, uh, which is the one which basically contains those people that specifically stated, no religion in the 2021 census. Um, the title of that is a little bit cumbersome. Uh, oh, sorry, let me, before, before I uh, make that point. Uh, so level one, what it does, it, it, it compresses the 150 or so different more detailed categories within the census, um, uh, 150 different or approaching 150 different detailed character, characteristics of religion. Um, at level four. Um, so what it does is aggregate them up to level one. Um, the, as it happens, 98.8% uh, of the 9.9 .9 million responses to this group, which we call no religion, um, were actually, they specifically chose no religion. So in fact, there's, statistically, there's absolutely no difference between the people that chose no religion and the people that chose other flavors of no religion, such as, for example, humanism or rationalism or, oddly enough, atheism, uh, which were you know, included in this classification of religions for some bizarre reason. Um, but um, uh, anyway, 98.8% of the 9.9 .9 million responses to, uh, the, uh, to, to the, in the group seven um, uh, category actually specifically chose no religion. So first disclaimer is that I'm working at that level uh, and no religion includes people that have chosen things like rationalism, atheism and spiritualism and various other um, less common uh, var variations. Um, and also another disclaimer is, is that what I've done is to reduce the wording of this group, uh, which the ABS call secular beliefs and other spiritual beliefs and no religious affiliation. So it's quite a mouthful. Well, I've reduced all that down to no religion because I think it's more practical and, um, 
uh, and you know probably statistically will make absolutely no difference uh, to the to the conclusions that we'll be seeing. So those are my two sort of technical disclaimers, if you like, um, which um, hopefully will make it a little bit more accessible. Um, okay, I'll talk a little bit more about the other data sources that I'm going to be using, uh, and when I've gone through that evidence, we'll then summarize you know, what we can discern as defining the non-religious in Australia. And then I'll say a little bit about um, the Census 21 coalition, which is sort of morphing towards Census 2026 20, and, and give an update on the, uh, the status and the plan uh, in relation to the 2026 census planning and uh, use that to lead into uh, some questions and discussion. Um, and as Les said, you know, I'd expect that uh, this will take me probably around about 45 minutes um, you know, from, from here. Um, okay, let's start off with some basic, um, uh, so, some, some historical information about re religious affiliation. And I'm using the word affiliation largely because the Australian Bureau of Statistics uses that term uh, in... Uh, in, in relation to the measurement of religion in the Australian census. I have personally have a problem with the use of the term affiliation uh, because it means it gives a lot of scope for people to um, choose who they might be affiliated, even though they've got no practical uh, or even intellectual association with the religion. It's just who they feel more affiliated with. So if they feel like they're a cultural Christian, for example, then they might just put down Christian in the answer, or they might put down the religion they were born with, such as Catholicism or Anglicanism or something like that, um, even though their current religion um, is effectively no religion. So uh, it's in the interests, I think, of religious organisations um, that the ABS continues using this term affiliation, um, although I think that what it results in is, uh, is a still undercounted uh, quantity of the people who are not religious in Australia. But the chart is showing basically what's happened since 1971, and that's a pretty clear trend. Basically, a decline in Christianity which if anything has accelerated over the last 10 years or so. Uh, the growth of no religion, which more or less mirrors the decline in Christianity, um, with the exception of probably some growth coming from other religions, which of course includes um, Hindu Islam, uh, to a lesser extent Judaism, uh, but Buddhism uh, and, and other religions, uh, which have uh, slightly, slightly increased. Um, so that trend is something which has been well documented and what that results in uh, is that as of census, census uh, 2021, we had about 39%, give or take a few percentage points, uh, that indicated that they had no religion and about 44%, again, give or take a few decimal points, um, that indicated that they were associated with some form of Christianity. Uh, and if you were to extend those lines through to 2026, you'll see that, in fact, in 2024, we probably, those lines are probably already crossed, um, assuming that they would be continuing in the same trajectory, which is an assumption in its own right. But that's been the trend. Um, so no religion is on, on, on the uh, increase. This is a slide I have used before, but I, I think, I mean, I think it tells some interesting patterns. What it's showing on the right in an Australian bar, and that's over here on the right, um, you can see that we've got, I think it's 38.4, just slightly masked, 38.9% um, is the uh, overall Australian uh, measure for no religion in the 2021 census. But you can see how that varies by different um, cities and indeed the rest of the state. So in the case of, um, uh, Sydney, for example, and Sydney is the blue figure, which is a capital city, um, and the orange is the rest of New South Wales, so it's the balance. So you can see quite interesting differences between the capital city and the country, and likewise in Melbourne and Victoria and in the other combinations there. So hopefully that's reasonably clear to interpret. And what you can see, of course, um, is that uh, the country is generally uh, 
more non-religious than the capital cities um, that occur in those states, uh, which is probably, I think, was a little bit of a surprise to me when I first discovered this, this particular characteristic. And it kind of, um, you know, begs, well, why is that question? Well, uh, you could say that, you know, and certainly in the case of Melbourne and Sydney, which have reasonably high migrant populations, um, that that's where uh, alternative religions are to uh, come to the fore. Um, or you could say that in the country, um, the reality is, is that people have actually moved away from religion as being um, uh, a way of bringing themselves together in a community sense uh, in country areas. Um, so there's probably a couple of different dimensions you could take. I mean, in community in the country is probably more, um, I suspect that people attend football matches in the country rather more than they attend uh, religious services. Um, and uh, perhaps they form a very similar function these days, I don't know. Um, but uh, they certainly bring people together as a community and communities is, uh, is one of the, the key motivations and the key, um, uh, if you like, things which satisfy people's need to belong to a religion is that sense of community. So interesting difference between, in most states, you know, the, 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 the cities and the country, Brisbane and Queensland are pretty similar. Um, but in general, in the, in the larger states, the country is more non-religious uh, than the cities uh, in general. The overall pattern, I think, is also interesting. Tasmania leads the way, uh, Adelaide uh, and country South Australia not far behind, uh, and ACT, all these, um, you know, the, uh, the hard left, the socialist rebels, rabble uh, in, um, in Canberra, uh, clearly um, are demonstrating, are nailing their flag to the mast uh, of, of no religion. So I think it tells an interesting story about, you know, where people um, reside um, with their no religion characteristic. Uh, this this uh, slide is talking about very age specific uh, characteristics. So you can see there going from age one through to about age 99. And this particular one is just focusing on the um, uh, the not stated. So, you know, there is a proportion of people who don't answer the question about religion. Um, surprisingly, it's only about six or seven percent or thereabouts as an average across the entire population. Look at it in an age specific way and you'll see that um, I reckon or I like to think that what we've got is a whole bunch of octogenarian rebels here who um, object to answering the census question. And so we've got, you know, once you get, it seems about 75 and above, you know, it seems that people become, their rebellious um, side comes out into the open and, uh, and they refuse to answer the question. Uh, of course, they, um, I don't know, are being belligerent or something or non-compliant. The other, um, if I overlay onto that, uh, the uh, Hindu and Islam, uh, age-wise, you'll see, as you might expect, that there's a fall off when you get to the late 40s, because both of these uh, groups, the people who are coming from the Middle East, uh, from uh, North Africa and from South Asia, of course, um, have really only started arriving in the last 25, 30, 35 years. And that's reflected in the age profile. So uh, we're now getting a lot of people who are belonging to those uh, uh, religions, which are still, of course, below 10% um, overall, uh, but you can see that the age profile of those is, is much younger uh, than it is for other groups. If I put onto that the uh, Christianity trend across the age groups, very interesting that essentially what we've got here is um, a big dip in the mid, mid uh, fr uh, after the mid teens. We've got a peak in the, te in the mid teens, and then we've got a big dip. Uh, so the big dipper um, there of, um, of Christianity uh, rising again through to the uh, to, to the uh, uh, that, that big dip really kind of is there until the mid 40s. And then uh, as you go older and older, um, you know, Christianity uh, does tend to be high. Interesting how, um, you know, maybe people who were formerly Christians are maybe less committed when they get to their 80s and 90s, I don't know. And so they prefer not to state anything at all 
rather than to declare themselves as, as uh, continuing Christians. And if I overlay on that again, our non-religious uh, trend by age, you can almost see it's, it's a bit like a, a mirror image, um, really. It's a reflection of the, um, of the, 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 the changes and the decline in Christianity. So you'll see um, there's a large number of people, I think it should be even higher than this, uh, who are identified as not religious. Um, it's hard to say how you can describe someone who's under the age of five as being uh, belonging to any religion, really. Um, but people do tend to do that. Um, in the case of uh, Christian people, there's probably 30% who are describing their children as being Christian, even though they probably don't really know what it means. Um, but um, uh, the uh, uh, as, as we come down, religion, you know, the no religion numbers do decline. Uh, it has its own dip in the teens. And you could say this is the kind of peak area where, you know, um, parents are sending their kids to private schools, which are often uh, religious schools. Um, the facilities and uh, the appeal and the status um, still appeals to an awful lot of parents who will send their children to those schools. Um, but of course, once those children seem to leave school, then there's a big, big drop off, as I indicated before, and a reflective uh, increase in the people who are identifying as not religious at all. Interestingly, the crossover occurs in around about the early 40s, uh, where Christianity comes to the fore again with an older demographic, and there's a slow tail off for the uh, non-religious. And so those of us that are uh, at this end of the kind of spectrum, um, you know, we're very much in the minority um, still. Uh, <clears throat> So there's the sort of age profile, if you like, of uh, different of some of the key religious groups in Australia. This one may take a little bit of explaining to pick it up. Um, this is sort of a device called a uh, an age sex pyramid is what it's called. Uh, and by way of trying to make sense of the chart, we focus on the left hand side, on the Christian side, um, Christianity as compared to no religion. So if we look at the Christianity side, you'll see that all the percentage figures on the left-hand side, which is the female side, are higher than the figures on the right-hand side, with the exception of this youngest group here uh, on the male side. So in general, in terms of Christianity, there's a slight tendency for there to be more females than males identifying as uh, uh, belonging to some sort of Christian affiliation. Uh, the percentages scale is down there with the numbers indicated. So that kind of shape, um, typically a demographer would describe that as being like an hourglass. And if you're a cynic, you might say that the time is ticking for Christianity, um, but that may be taking a little bit far. When you look on the other side on the no religion um, figures, and you'll see that there's a slight opposite. You know, there's a greater tendency, all the figures on the male side are slightly higher than they are for the female side. So you're reasonably safe to say that, um, you know, there is a, a greater tendency for uh, people who are not religious uh, to be male, very slightly. Um, that seems to be the case. But the shape of the pyramid, again, is, is quite contrasting. And typically, this kind of pyramid here, um, when, when you see a country's demographics represented, in this sort of device called an age sex pyramid, um, you'd normally describe this as being, um, it's characteristic of a country that has a very young population, uh, but also a rapidly growing population. So if you were to extrapolate from the way demographers look at national age sex pyramids um, and uh, compare that to say this uh, structure for uh, no religion, you know, you could speculate that here's, further evidence that no religion is, is, is growing uh, and um, Christianity is perhaps stagnating um, without showing that sort of uh, uh, rapid growth. But again, uh, looking to the future, you know, things may not continue on the same trends. Things may look different in five or 10 years time uh, to what I'm representing here. But the indication of this is, is that there is a growth uh, in no religion and of course, and again, you can see that in the comparative percentages, um, which are in those younger age groups. 
I've also looked um, at education as a dimension of religion from the census as well. And uh, what I'm looking at here is basically the highest, the highest education achievers in Australia. And I'm comparing it with the average for Australia as a, whole, as a whole. So if we look, for example, at Christianity, then Christianity nationally in Australia is shown by the orange bar is about 44%. However, people who have a postgraduate degree is quite a bit lower than that. We're looking at somewhere in the mid thirties. Uh, and by another token, if we look at our no religion group over here, which nationally are averaging about 38%, it's not a huge difference, but you can see that we're looking at 42, 43%, 42% thereabouts um, that are of no religion uh, amongst this group. So the long and the short of it is, is that people with postgraduate degrees, oh, I'll, I'll point out these two down here, which I think are quite significant, very much more significant um, uh, postgraduate representation amongst people who identify as Hindus and to a lesser extent with Islam. So our migrant groups coming from South Asia um, and from Islamic background, uh, highly educated, highly motivated migrants who may have come to Australia as students, either as undergraduate or postgraduate students, and working in, uh, in the field of academia, uh, business um, academia, uh, possibly medical uh, areas, um, are definitely uh, well in excess um, in, in the postgraduate uh, area um, compared with uh, their representation um, across the wider population. So you might conclude from that that, you know, generally uh, people who are, who are very highly educated uh, tend to be more or less, less Christian uh, and slightly more non-religious um, in, in that way. Another way of looking at education, slightly different way of representing figures here. Let me explain this a little bit to try and make it a little bit easier to uh, understand. If you like, the national average is represented by this center line here, zero. So uh, that's that would be the national average for all of the um, all of those different levels of education. So going from secondary and below through diploma, cert three and four bachelor and grad dips, and then uh, a postgraduate. So going from, if you like, a lower education attainment through to a higher ed education attainment there. And if we focus on the blue lines, what we can see is at the secondary level, then our Christian population is significantly larger, like more than 7% um, above uh, in those people who have a secondary and below secondary education. Slightly less than average is no religion. If we look at our diploma level, likewise, again, there's an excess or uh, above average proportion of people uh, with diplomas tend to be above the national average um, for uh, Christianity, slightly below, again, for Christianity. When we get to the cert uh, for no religion, when we get to cert three and cert four level, um, and uh, bach bachelor grad dip and postgraduate, the picture changes. So we see that no religion becomes a, above the national average, uh, and Christianity begins to tail off. So you could say there's almost an inverse correlation between education and whether you are Christian, in effect. And basically, the more educated you are. What this is suggesting is the less likely you are to be Christian. The more educated you are, the more likely you are to be of no religion. So I think um, you know that was uh, for me one of the more interesting kind of discoveries of the analysis which I did, uh, which is just sort of again showing that education is a key part of um, how you might define yourself in the Australian religious landscape. Uh, moving on to another dimension, which is migrants. And again, what I've done here is to show the national level of no religion, which is shown by this horizontal line. And looking at um, the proportion of no religion 
according to when they arrived in Australia. So you can see that people who arrived pre-1960, primarily, of course, Southern European, Italians, Greeks, uh, et cetera, was a low proportion, well below the current national average. You know, 22% or so were um, of, uh, of are of no religion, uh, of people who arrived, who migrated to Australia at that time. More recent migrants, a higher proportion of non-religion. From 1980 onwards, you know, we probably peaked. And you might argue, well, we might speculate about, you know, why it is uh, there was a steady growth. Um, the more recent the people have migrated in terms of proportion of non-religious. Um, but you might argue, well, what's, what's going on here? You know, the most recent batch of migrants, 2011, that last 10 years, um, have, have dropped off. Well, you could partly explain that by being maybe an increase of those people who are migrating. Uh, Indians are now the largest migrant group to Australia. Of course, Indians of Hinduism uh, embedded in their cultural identity. Um, and likewise, uh, uh, also, um, you know, perhaps they've overtaken the Chinese. And of course, maybe it's Chinese migrants uh, that you know, may have been the driver behind uh, the growth that may have occurred in these decades as well. But the mix is changing. And I think more recently, because of a much higher Indian migration, uh, we may have seen a drop off, at least in terms of first generation migrants. And what I might do is to explore that theme about uh, first generation versus later generation migrants in the next slide. Uh, actually, two ways I would look at it. This one is a complex chart. I, I, I apologize for its complexity, but there's a lot of information in there, which I think is really worth um, uh, you know, just reflecting on. What I've done is to show the countries of birth along the bottom and to show just the major kind of groups of religion or the major ones of most interest. I've tended to ignore Buddhism, even though it's quite a large religion, um, but um, I've found the patterns with these ones, which I'm representing to be most interesting. So if we look at the left one, born Australia, we can see that um, people here um, uh, are, you know, not, there's, there's a pretty even balance between people born in, for people born in Australia, you've probably got about 44%, as we said, of Christianity and our, you know, um, again, probably around about, you know, mid 40s percent um, are going to be of no religion. So these are people specifically born in Australia. So it's not all Australians, just those that are born in Australia. So pretty balanced, really, between Christian and no religion these days. Um, if we look at some of the other kind of, we'll take Christianity, in fact, if we just look at the blue bars, which are those which are representing Christianity, We've got the Nisias, what I call the Nisias, Polynesia, Micronesia, Melanesia, you know, getting close to 60% of Christian by country of birth, um, you know, reflecting the success, if you like, of missionary zeal um, in, in, that, in those, those uh, island communities. Also picking up the Hindu uh, dimension as well, primarily Fijian Indians, I would suspect. Um, and a very, very low proportion of no religion. Um, so quite a different sort of pattern there, comparing with, say, um, you know, the, religion, the pattern for Christianity elsewhere, uh, and indeed you know, the uh, no religion. So there's real big differences which are coming out there. Christianity tends to be high in southern, southeastern, and um, uh, eastern Europe, um, it also tends to be high in uh, South and Central America over here uh, and Sub-Saharan -Sub Africa, again, reflecting the success of um, missions and uh, conversions uh, in uh, Africa's colonial uh, history. Uh, and their appeal about coming to what they might perceive as being a, a, a country that um, <coughs> would uh, support their, uh, their Christian beliefs. If you look at no religion, interestingly, I think uh, people coming from North America, there's a high proportion of them are of no religion. Northeast, Northeast Asia, China, Japan, 
no religion, uh, much stronger uh, in those areas. UK, Western, Northern Europe uh, tend to be uh, reasonably highly represented and indeed New Zealanders as well. So there's a lot of information here in terms of, you know, country of birth by religious affiliation. And you can see that it's, it's just enormously different. Islam, I think, may be worth a mention as well. Central Asia, it's not a huge number, I'd have to say. In absolute numbers, it's, it's relatively small. But the proportion of people coming from Central Asia uh, that are Islamic, this is from Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, not many of them, of course, um, and similar, some of those are other stands, um, uh, Pakistan as well, in, in, in fact, um, you know, would be um, uh, predominantly Muslim. Likewise, North Africa, Middle East, and to a lesser extent, South Asia. So uh, by country of birth, you know, there's, there's a, an interesting mix. But to, re, to, to go back to the sort of migrant theme, or to continue the migrant theme, this next chart, again, looks at variation from the, from the, um, uh, from, from the different uh, groups. So if we look at ancestry compared with what I'm looking at here, Sorry, let me go back one step. In the census, there are, there's a question about which country you come from, where you were born. There's also a question about ancestry. So what, I, what ancestry do you identify with? And in general, even though you may not be born in Australia, um, you might still identify with um, an ancestry which comes, for example, from South, Southeast Asia and East Europe. Now, if you compare... Uh, ancestry with country of birth, so the central line is country of birth, then the proportion who are Christian coming from South, Southeastern and Eastern Europe is significantly lower, probably to the degree of 8 or 9% when compared with no religion. So in other words, the second and third, I'm, I'm guessing here or estimating the second or third generation effect it's very difficult to get precise numbers on it. But when you look at ancestry, ancestry is not as strong in terms of its Christianity for South, Southeast Asia and East Europe um, as, as is country of birth. So there's some evidence, I think, through this kind of um, graphic, which suggests that um, second and third generation are losing their religion, their strength of religious connection. Um, and uh, and I think that that's probably also true of people coming from North Africa, Middle East, to a lesser extent, where I think there's probably more stickiness to the religion, uh, being Islam primarily. Um, there's more stickiness to Islam. Um, you know, it's part of the uh, religious code that, uh, um, you know, it's a, the equivalent of um, uh, a mortal sin, for want of a better phrase. Uh, for you to leave your religion um, if you're coming from an Islamic um, code. Uh, and also in South and Central America, where there's perhaps more recent migrants uh, compared to our South, Southeast and uh, Eastern Europe um, migrants. So, you know, there's they're perhaps um, still got a greater stickiness uh, to their um, religion of their parents' birth. But what this is showing is that I think it does estimate, it does show, gives some evidence that when people have been here for some time, their children tend not to follow their parents' religion um, that they brought with them when they migrated to Australia. Okay, moving away from the census, um, I also used um, uh, another um, data source, which is the, uh, it's called the Australian Electoral Study. And this was a, um, I don't know if anyone has come across Neil Francis's religiosity in Australia, but he drew on this amongst other data sources uh, quite heavily in his work um, on the, uh, in compiling the Religiosity in Australia series, which was published by the Rationalist Society and is available on their website. Um, he, his, his work was based on the Australian Electoral Study up to, I believe, 2019. What I've done is just to look at this, the Australian Electoral Study in isolation um, for 2022. And the Australian Electoral Study is something which is conducted after every federal election. 
So it's commissioned by the government um, uh, across a whole range of things. Uh, and religion is not, is, I mean, it's, religion is only a small part of it. Um, but there's a whole range of attitudes to uh, politics and um, uh, views on a whole range of sort of social issues which are recorded in the Australian Electoral Study. And in general, it's a great data set that you can then align with uh, political preferences. But what I'm showing here is the, again, the main, in, the main religions of interest, which I think are Catholic, Anglican, other Christian, and no religion. And looking at how people responded with the question on the Australian Electoral Study, um, which is basically the question is politically, where would you place yourself on the political spectrum, left to right? The scale was actually naught to 10, but what I've done is to compress it so we can just see it more simply. Um, and I think, it, and also comparing that with the other question, which is what is your religion or faith? So comparing those two questions and extracting what I think are the most interesting and significant bits of it, um, what we can see is that um, we can see the sort of where people sit on the political spectrum. So the Catholics up here generally are fairly centrist. You know, they're not not an enormous amount of difference. The orange one is 50% would sit in the center on how they would see themselves politically. Um, and, you know, the right and left are probably pretty much the same. So you could say that Catholic fairly centrist. If you look at the Anglican and the other Christian, then they tend to be more cent more center right. So the right tends to emerge much more strongly. You look at no religion, and again, it's the opposite. It's center left, very much on the left part of the spectrum. So from a political perspective, we're seeing some evidence that people who are declaring themselves of no religion align very much with the center left type perspective in terms of political attitudes. I think that's something which comes out quite clearly in that. Another chart from the same survey, and by, and by the way, this is it's very robust. This is hugely well respected. It's run by the Social Research Center, which is based in Melbourne, which is um, a fully owned business uh, operated out of the Australian National University in Canberra, um, and it is I, I know of a number I know a number of people at the Social Research Center, and they're highly qualified academics. Um, who uh, have absolutely no compromise in terms of their survey methodologies. Um, they're, uh, they're second to none in the country in terms of their reputation uh, and their methods. Looking at another chart here, this is uh, where we're looking at, uh, again, it's what is your religion or faith? And I've chosen a number of religions to represent here on the left. Um, but the questions here is basically, it's drawn from two questions. And what I've derived is, if you like, a two-party preferred vote by religion. So we can see, if you like, uh, how people of different religions voted in the federal election of 21st of May in 2022. So the question was, in the election for the House of Representatives on Saturday, 21st of May, which party did you vote for first? And then what I've used as a second question to derive a two-party preferred. If your first preference was for a minor party, which of the two major parties did you vote for in the House of Representatives? So deriving from those questions, what I've been able to represent is, and in fact, people who identified as Catholic, you know, are actually, again, pretty balanced. You know, traditionally people have thought that Catholics were Labour. Um, and, uh, you know, that's debatable in its own right, but um, uh, it's, uh, yeah, you know, the evidence is showing, in fact, that certainly in the 2022 election, um, there's very little between Liberal and ALP in terms of two-party preferred. Likewise with Orthodox, remarkably similar. Um, and with the, um, uh, the no religion, which I think is staggering, you can see that, in fact, 68% of people who are no religion actually chose... Um, the ALP and on a two-party preferred basis, uh, which I think is quite staggering, 68%. And I think the Labour Party really needs to know about that. Um, it, it is quite a staggering skew, in my view. And I think if the Labour Party doesn't recognise 
the electoral power of the no religion lobby, uh, then they're missing a trick and are exposing themselves to be undone by, you know, um, by literally uh, ignoring um, the voting power of this of this particular group. Um, you look at Anglican and other Christian, and maybe unsurprisingly, they tend to be much more liberal national coalition voters. Um, well over 50% uh, would be, uh, have chosen uh, liberal and uh, or national coalition. Um, the other interesting thing I think is that other non-Christian, which is where we're bringing in our Hindus and our Islamic people again, tend on balance to be rather more no religion than they are, uh, sorry, rather more ALP than they are um, liberal national coalition. So it's, um, I think, uh, you know, the perspectives on voting, I think, are also very significant. I've got one more bar chart uh, to, uh, to throw at you. Uh, and this one, again, is coming from the same survey, the Australian Electoral Study. And the question this time that I'm looking at by religion is the question, apart from weddings, funerals and baptisms, how often do you attend religious services? So at least once, so it's the frequency of attending the service, at least once a week, once a month, several times a year, at least once a year, less than once a year, and never. Perhaps no surprise at all, no religion is in the high 80% in terms of never attending a service. Uh, you wouldn't expect anything else probably from that. But looking at the, um, uh, the most, uh, uh, looking at the most uh, recent, the most regular ones, then of course uh, we've got um, the thing that I find interesting is that in fact it's other Christian which is showing the greatest uh, regularity of attendance. Now, that would include groups like the Baptists, Presbyterians, Pentecostals, uh, and those kind of non-mainstream, but still quite significant and quite powerful um, religious groups that would be very regular church attendees. Almost 30% of people who identify in those other Christian groups that I did, identified you know, would be attending a church service once a week. I'm sure the Catholics and the Anglicans and the Orthodox would love to have that kind of attendance these days. It doesn't seem to be there. Um, even other, other non-Christians, so Hindus, Islam, etc., are only around about 15% on a regular attendance. And the staggering thing is, is overall, the numbers of regular attendees devouts, if you like, as uh, Neil Francis calls them in his uh, Religiosity in Australia series, um, is, uh, is really quite low. And even you look at once a month, and it's actually an even smaller increment, several times a year, well, okay, that bumps up a little bit. But even in terms of like you look at never, the number of people who identify as Catholic, number of people who identify as Anglican, who never actually attend a church service, tells you about um, the problem, I think, um, uh, or the opportunity, not the problem, the, the opportunity, I think, for working with the ABS to try to diminish, uh, to, to help them to, um, to properly measure the non-religious, because it's, it's really hard to say that these people here are religious or that they have a religion if they never attend a church service. So you know, our challenge is to try to steer the ABS uh, to understand that this measure of a cultural religious affiliation is giving us quite misleading data. And why is that data important? Well, of course it's important because of the massive amounts of funding and the policy decisions uh, and the airtime that's given um, to uh, you know, not the non-religious, um, compared with the religious lobby is, is totally disproportionate. You look at the proportion of people who are regularly attending, compare it with people who rarely or never attend, and you compare it with who the experts are that are consulted on matters where religion, religious opinion is sought, 
Um, it will be the ACL that will, the Australian Christian Lobby that will be, that will go to for opinions. It will be the bishops of the Catholic Church, um, the archbishops of the Anglicans, etc. They're the ones that are always approached for comment on key matters of national interest. Uh, and our big challenge uh, in the non-religious community is to counter that voice and to balance that voice. And one way in which we can do that is to actually get the data right in the census, to which I will turn attention uh, in a few moments. One last chart, um, I promise. Um, and uh, this one is looking at it a third source, this is my third source of evidence that I'm using in this presentation. This one comes from the National Church Life Survey from, 19, from 2018. So it's a little few years out of date, but I think it shows some interesting things and a little bit about the National Church Life Survey. It's quite robust research, 1200 people in there. Um, the National Church Life Survey is an organization um, the board of which uh, is comprised of clerics from many different strands of uh, Christianity, in essence. Uh, but let's look at what they're telling us. Well, they're saying 35% on the scales that they use, 35% were neither non-religious. Sorry, they were neithers. So they were non-religious and they were non-spiritual. So they, were, they, they weren't spiritual and they weren't religious. So 35%, which I think is interesting because it's, you know, 39% in the census, 35% here are ident they identified as non-religious themselves, even though it is a religious organization that is conducting this research, essentially a religious organization. So they're finding figures which are not similar, except that when you add on this group up here, 13% is what they found were people who are spiritual but not religious. Now, spiritual but not religious is a, is a group that's even more difficult, I think, to get a handle on than perhaps uh, neither's down here. But what they're saying is, is that 48%, if you add those two together, 48% essentially are at the lower end of the religious scale. Again, a religious organization that is saying that 48%, remember the census says 39%, 40, they're saying, 48% are either spiritual but not religious or they're straight non-religious and not spiritual. I think those figures are quite startling. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're, they're so much more credible because they come from an organisation which is led by uh, Christian clerics. Only 26% they identify as being practising religious and spiritual people. Um, so... I think interesting figures, which are coming from, um, you know, quite an interesting source. Okay, I'll try and summarise all the stuff that I've just gone through, through a whole stack of charts. And what can we see? Well, the non-religious tend to be under 40, and there's a slight skew towards males. Generally, they're more prominent in country Australia and in the ACT. Well-educated on the whole. Generally born in Australia or in Southeast or Northeast Asia. Less likely to be born in India, Middle East, Africa, or Southern Europe. I think there's some evidence that religion is fading for second and third generation migrant backgrounds. So the longer they're in Australia, the more their religious connection seems to fade in those areas or those countries of birth where religion was an important dimension. They tend to be center left on the political spectrum and ALP voters specifically in the last election. They're less likely to be working class. This is something I, I haven't produced a chart for that, but again, it came out of the Australian electoral study. Um, they tend to be less likely to be working class, self-described way of defining uh, one's you know, class, whether they consider themselves upper middle or middle class or whatever. So they're less likely to be working class. So, uh, I didn't present the evidence on that, but that is the case. Um, and the other thing from the National Church Life Survey, more than one in 10 Australians are spiritual but not religious. So, um, you know, that, that spiritual but not religious group, I think, is something which is uh, worth trying to understand a bit more. So 
I've tried to sort of um, in this slide to to try to show some pointers really towards uh, what the um, spiritual uh, but no religious uh, are about. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about those in a moment. But in terms of non-religious, certainly the spiritual but not religious comprise <clears throat> more than 20% of the non-religious. So the 13 plus 35 gives you 48. So they're more than 20% of the what they consider non-religious are actually spiritual but not religious, whatever that might mean. Um, the non-religious are also, of course, refugees from religion. And you know, I don't need to uh, tell people like Les, the sort of people that we're talking about. You know, the, this is the uh, recovering from religion people, um, the, uh, um, the, the group that, um, uh, that, uh, that Les runs himself, you know, the ex-religious support network. Um, in the UK, a group called Faith to Faithless um, is, uh, you know, sort of performing similar roles of helping people, particularly from high control religions, uh, to uh, uh, define themselves and to support them in their transition uh, from a religious background, uh, often a high control one to uh, one which is uh, um, a, a position that's much more accepting. Uh, rejectors, I probably count myself in this, you know, having been brought up as a Catholic, um, you know, I would uh, so you know, I've moved on from religion for a variety of reasons. People do it for different reasons partly because of education experience. In my, in my case, you know, I was a student of geography and geology. And if you study geology, um, you know, even at a fairly young age, um, you soon begin to realize that there seems to be a few things at odds with uh, some of the claims that religion uh, makes um, on a whole variety of things. Um, so, um, and also, um, it's partly because I think of uh, changing society norms, you know, so there are people who are rejecting religion because society media um, is not presenting uh, on the whole um, something which is supportive or encouraging people to re remain aligned to a religion. And it's partly, I think, due to the disaffection that's uh, uh, being caused by, you know, the evidence of institutional uh, abuse, um, which has occurred over you know, quite some decades um, and is is well known, I'm sure, to everybody. So there's people who have been rejecting. Then, of course, there are the free thinkers, you know, people like us, if you like. Um, we're inspired by alternatives, the humanists, the rationalists, the skeptics, except the existentialists and secularists, etc. As well as that, there's the dyed-in-the-wool atheists, the people who have never been anything else but an atheist, and they wonder what all this fuss is about, about religion. I'm thinking here of someone like Viktor Franco, who is a, a councillor at Burundara City Council in Melbourne, um, who is uh, who's never never had any association with religion? Doesn't understand what the fuss is. Quite interesting, really, because he's he's of a Spanish background. Um, but uh, you know, you could uh, never meet anyone who is less Catholic aligned or or Christian aligned than uh, than Victor Franco, a complete um, you know, uh, rationalist and and never known anything else but atheist. Um, and um, then there's the passive or the apathetic, the people that don't really are not engaged one way or the other with religion. And so by default, they are non-religious. Um, so long and long and short of it is it's a pretty varied group. <laughs> if you, you know, if, you, if I choose a wrong analogy, I could describe it as being quite a broad church, really, but anything but. But it's um, but the interesting thing is that quite often there is a um even though there's a lot of diversity within the non-religious group, and, and non-religion itself is quite a negative term, which is a little bit unfortunate, but um, quite often a, a blunt distinction is made between the religious and the non-religious. Sometimes it's in certain people's interest to do that, but um, uh, that blunt distinction, uh, I think, is, is perhaps, uh, particularly when you look at things like spiritual but not religious, is perhaps Perhaps it's a little bit more subtle than just a binary distinction between the two. Um, but one thing's for sure is that the identity differences between um, the religious and the non-religious is sharpening. Um, any of those of you who went to the conference in Sydney in December or have seen Leslie Canold's uh, presentation, which is available on YouTube, um, 
will know that um, polarization is a feature of um, how many societies are changing. And if you know, there's no better country in the world to exemplify that right now than the United States, um, where polarization and division have been almost you know, promoted um, uh, over the last 10 years or so. Um, so the identity differences between the religious and non-religious is, um, is part, I think, of that, that kind of increased polarization. You could argue that religious schools are becoming more religious, uh, perhaps they, uh, and exclusive. Um, you know, they're um, trying to keep people out of the te- out of the classroom, teachers, good teachers, out of the classroom, who um, don't conform to the ethos, whatever that might mean, of the school, or don't reflect the values of the religion. Um, of the school in which they work. Um, so perhaps as they feel more threatened by progressive um, policies and and policy and law changes um, that you know protect the rights of LGBTI um, and and others, um, and you know the failure of the religious dis- discrimination bill and the conflicts between their ability to be able to discriminate and choose their employees and who to kick out and whenever they kick them out. Um, all of that is becoming so much more apparent, I think, over the last 10 years or so, um, uh, partly as a response maybe to more progressive policies, voluntary assisted dying, abortion, um, access to you know, sexual health services in public hospitals, etc. A lot of this is now being highlighted and it's t- bringing around a polarisation. And the religious discrimination bill itself, of course, is probably in limbo because um, apparently you know, irreconcilable differences between um, different parties in this case, uh, preventing a bipartisan outcome that's going to probably benefit society more than if there wasn't some form of religious discrimination bill uh, in, in, a, in an appropriate form, not the form that it was in first time round. Um, so, you know, th- there are some thoughts really um, that I guess I that have gone through my mind in thinking about this presentation about about the religious, but I'll move on now fairly quickly into the, the kind of the, the first of the bullet points here, which is really about counting the non-religious and the importance of the census, why we must get it right. Of course, I think everyone knows why, you know, it is the gold standard of data. Data is used as evidence. Evidence is what supports policy and funding allocations <clears throat> and all sorts of other decisions that are made uh, in society. So if the data isn't right, then we need to uh, we need to worry, and we need to work hard to try and make sure it is right. Now, to every credit uh, credit of the ABS, um, they responded to some submissions that um, the Census 21 Coalition Group made, um, and uh, the intent of the submissions was basically to ask the ABS to review the question uh, as it was in 2021, and the question if you may or may not recall, what is the person's religion? Many people have a big problem with that because it presumes that you have a religion in the first place. I think the analogy is it's a bit like saying, how many children do you have? You know, the assumption is that you have children. And likewise, with what is the person's religion? You know, it assumes that they have a religion. Um, and, um, you know, other problems, I think, with that, you know, the ridiculous inclusion of atheism as an example of a, of a religion, of an other religion, is just absolutely bizarre. Um, but to the credit of the ABS, you know, they've listened and they're currently going out with a testing of an alternative question. And that question, the wording has changed. And you also see that they've removed tick boxes. We didn't have a real strong view about removing tick boxes. Um, my own view, I think, is um, uh, now understands why it is that they've chosen to do that. And um, I don't really have too much of a problem with that. But the two, the two things that they've changed, they've dropped the tick boxes and they've also um, changed the wording in the question. So first, the question is, does the person have a religion? No or yes? Well, that seems sensible and we're happy with that. And it's in line with what we were probably the best hope that we had. Um, you know, it's uh, it's good. And the examples they've given here, well, there are none, none that are um, that we could really take issue with. I mean, most of them 
you could probably describe as uh, a religion. Arguably, Aboriginal traditional beliefs may not be a religion, but certainly the others are. And, um, and it's also trying to encourage people to think about different types of, for example, Buddhism, whereas Buddhism appeared here without any subsets. Islam also appeared here. And representations were made in the consultation process, not by us, but by other groups, um, that they felt that, you know, for example, Sunni was not recognized as a distinctive branch of Islam compared with, say, um, Shia or other minority types of Islam. And what this box, this freeform box allows is for people to describe their religion as they want, rather than being lazy and ticking Islam um, or you know, just Buddhist without recognizing the different um, strands of Buddhism which are important to certain interests in Australia, and quite rightly. Um, so that's the proposed 20, 26 question which they are going out with. Now, you're probably aware that there's been an awful lot of, which before I go into that, I'll just by comparison quickly draw attention to what they do overseas. So England and Wales 2021, in fact, had exactly the same question as we had. What is your religion? Not surprising because I think, you know, the British and the Australian census people probably um, have, um, you know, many uh, uh, interactions and share their ideas and thinking. And whilst they might have a different order or list or whatever, but, um, you know, essentially they share notes on what they think works. That was England and Wales one in 2021. Ireland, interesting enough, in the 2022 census there, they added on, if any, which was probably our least acceptable change from the 2021 question that we were asking for. So at the very least, it was adding on, if any. Ireland managed to do that in 2022. And I think that that kind of change may have encouraged the ABS to start uh, at least thinking about changing things. Um, Scotland in 2021, what religion, religious domination or body do you belong to? Well, that's something which is much higher level of commitment than, you know, just simply what is your religion? It's what do you belong to? Belong makes uh, is a very different concept uh, compared with affiliation, which to me is a bit vague and uh, is likely to inflate the numbers of people who identify as religious. Um, so belong to, and then down here, um, they in, in Northern Ireland, they had a, um, a supplementary question, specific perhaps to Northern Ireland, maybe, what religion, religious denomination or body were you brought up in? So, you know, what do you belong to and what were you brought up in? Uh, giving two dimensions, what were you and what are you? Um, which is interesting. But Australia does have, you know, the opportunity, I think, to um, to take take a lead uh, in that. Um, and before I sort of continue or just close off the, the you know the presentation, I think the um, uh, uh, the other thing to say about this is that there's been a lot of controversy. Some people may have tuned into it or not. Uh, the Catholics. Um, got up in arms about the ABS going out with an alternative question and uh, have written, had various articles published in the Australian and Catholic Weekly. Um, and also uh, somebody wrote in uh, uh, Pearls and Irritations, um, which is a, an online um, publication uh, platform, um, sort of bemoaning, complaining about the ABS. And even John Howard weighed into it and started, you know, saying the ABS all a bunch of, you know, sort of woke lefties in effect, if I paraphrase what he was saying, um, and they need to pull their head in and all that sort of stuff. Um, but um, the ABS, to their credit, have uh, shown signs of resisting those kinds of um, um, uh, noise and um, got a late attendee by the looks of it, someone. Um, but um, it's... It, it, those changes of, um, are being resisted or those pressures are being resisted by the ABS. And it as it happens this Monday coming, I've got, a, uh, I've got a meeting with the Australian statistician, David Gruen, um, to restate our position um, as we put forward in the presentations, in the submissions that we made in 2023. 
um, and to and I should be taking every opportunity to encourage him to stay the course and to lead the way in getting the data right, getting the question right, uh, and um, uh, in the interest of more accurate data, not because we have a vested interest um, uh, as, as many of the religions do, because they know what the trends are like that I presented today and that worries them, um, but because we think it's much more important to get the data right, it's in everyone's interest to get the data right um, so that uh, the right policies and funding can be created. Um, I've put some other things up here about uh, trends or cycles, but I'm mindful um, that I've probably uh, indulged you far too much in terms of time. And um, I've, maybe these are the sorts of things that we could take up in, in, uh, in, in discussion um, in terms of the sort of the trends and the cycles. Briefly mentioned about the trends. I mean, clearly, as I showed earlier on, you know, the chances are that the... Um, uh, no religion will almost certainly overtake Christianity in 2026, even if the question isn't changed. Um, but if the question is changed, it will almost certainly do so, uh, even more so. Um, yeah, there are many things I could also comment on through the reading and the research that I've done for this in relation to, um, you know, what's happening in the bigger picture. Is it something that's uh, an ongoing trend or is it something that's cyclical? Uh, and also, um, you know, what uh, the role of community is for religious people and for non-religious people and how non-religious people and Humanist Australia is doing this. It's trying to create communities, um, which in a sense um, replace to an extent, uh, you know, the kind of communities that uh, uh, helped define and make religious uh, places of worship attractive for many, many people. And the last thing I've said there is who will speak for the non-religious. And so I'll pass over quickly those two middle bullet points, even though I've got many, much to say about that. And then um, just to mention the Secularism Australia Forum, which has had a little bit of exposure in uh, Humanist Australia's um, newsletter, recent newsletter, and in fact in today's or yesterday's Human, Humanist Victoria um, uh, newsletter, uh, which is... Um, drawing attention to the existence of the Secularism Australia Forum. It, it's, it's a development which has come out of the Secularism Australia conference held in December in Sydney last year. Um, and this is the kind of agenda. And the idea is to get these groups together, the rationalists, the uh, Humanist Australia, Humanist Victorious, National Secular Lobby, Atheist Foundation, uh, and, uh, and others as maybe fringe members, to come together in this forum to try to create a single voice for the non-religious so that we can be heard and that we become a go-to um, person or uh, identity for comment uh, on matters of, of uh, relevance, uh, to con clearly con to continue make re representations about the census, um, to, uh, to take on um, and to lobby for change in religious symbolism uh, in public, in the public domain, prayers, quasi-religious services such as Anzac Day, et cetera, to challenge, and this will be an ongoing one given the response of the Labour government, maybe I should show them those figures about who voted for um, the uh, Labour government uh, last time around, but charitable status, the, the, you know, the, the purpose of advancement of religion, which gives uh, religion religion's enormous privilege in terms of access to charitable status and disadvantages organisations like Humanist Australia, Humanist Victoria and Atheist Foundation, et cetera, um, and deductible gift status. Uh, healthcare is very much on our agenda. Education, many dimensions of education. Education is the really big one and probably the most important one of all of them, in my view, because it is so um, shaping of future communities. Uh, and pro-human rights, and uh, we'll keep an eye on what happens to Religious Discrimination Bill 2 um, if it emerges out of uh, limbo. So I've used more than my 45 minutes less. I apologise. There are some references here um, that I drew on uh, to an extent, uh, others as well, but uh, these ones in particular. One I will point out, Linda Woodhead and Andrew Copson, Humanist, Humanist UK do some great work, as we know. And um, 
I, I used a conversation between Andrew Copson, who's the CEO of Humanist UK, and Linda Woodhead, who is a uh, professor uh, at King's College in London in uh, sociology, I think, um, and a strong interest in religion. Happens to be a member of the Church of England herself, which I think is no bad thing. I mean, it's great that um, people who are members of church communities uh, can also see um, the benefits of aligning with a secularist cause. Uh, I have a particular view that I think secularism is in the interest of religious people as much as it is in the interest of non-religious people.